Hello and welcome to Talking About Health and All Policies. My name is Star Tiffany and along with my colleague Joanna Hathaway, we will be running today's web forum. If you experience technical difficulties during this WebEx session, please dial 1-866-229-3239 for assistance. You may want to write that number down just in case you need it in the future. The audio portion of the web forum can be heard through your computer speakers or a headset plugged into your computer. If at any time you are having technical difficulties regarding audio, please send a question in the Q&A panel and Joanna and I will provide the teleconference information to you. Once the web forum ends today, a survey evaluation will open in a new window. Please take a moment to complete the evaluation as we need your feedback to improve our web forum. We are encouraging you to ask questions throughout today's presentation. To do so, simply click the question mark icon, type your question in, and hit send. Please send your question to all panelists. We will be addressing questions both throughout and at the end of the presentation. We will be using the polling feature to get feedback during the event. The first poll is on screen now. Please select your answer from the available choices and click the submit button. Are you attending this web forum individually, in a group of two to five people, in a group of six to 10 people, in a group of more than 10 people? So just don't forget to click Submit. It is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for the day, Dr. Linda Rudolph. Dr. Linda Rudolph works at the Public Health Institute on Health and All Policies, Climate Change and Health, and Healthy Communities. She previously served as Deputy Director, California Department of Public Health, Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion. In that role, she served as the founding chair of the California Health and All Policies Task Force and the California Climate Action Team Public Health Work Group. Dr. Rudolph has also worked as the Health Officer and Director of Public Health for the City of Berkeley and the Chief Medical Officer for Medi-Cal Managed Care. Dr. Rudolph received her MD from the University of California, San Francisco and an MPH from UC Berkeley. She sees climate change as the most significant public health challenge of the 21st century. Dr. Rudolph, please go ahead. Good morning. I'm really excited about this um, webinar and this topic because I think it's one of the most important things that we can all learn how to do in public health is talk to people that aren't in public health about the issues that we hold near and dear to our heart. So the objectives for today's webinar are first to identify the key components of developing an effective message, second to um, Think about how to shift your communications lens from individuals to the social determinants of health, particularly in the context of a society that's very focused on individuals. And third, to develop some answers that will help you feel more comfortable in answering difficult questions about health and all policies. So before we move into our speakers, I want to just do a very, very quick overview of, um, uh, to put this in context. Health and All Policies is a collaborative approach to improving the health of all people by incorporating health considerations into decision-making processes across sectors and policy areas. And it's really born out of the recognition that the social determinants of health, the physical, social, economic, and services environments in which people live, work, learn, play, shop, and pray, have huge impacts on health. And that these social determinants, in fact, have a far greater impact on the health of populations than medical care. And the implications are that public health interventions that address community environments can have much more impact on health than more individually oriented health education, case management, or medical care interventions. 
We also know that these social determinants of health are the key drivers of significant and persistent health inequities, very large differences in health outcomes and life expectancy among neighborhoods, among racial and ethnic groups, and among people of different incomes. We know that people who live in neighborhoods with high rates of poverty, large numbers of non-white residents, are likely to have far fewer opportunities and resources for health, fewer parks, safe places to play, more fast food and liquor outlets, fewer healthy food choices, more violence, less trees, poorer quality housing, less access to jobs, poor performing schools, and so on. And finally, we know that climate change is the biggest global health threat of the 21st century, that, that it will have very, very significant impacts on health, both direct and indirect, some of which we're starting to see now, but also which will affect um, our children and grandchildren and impact the very life systems on which human life depends, our air, our water, our food, our shelter, our security. So the Department of Public Health, the Public Health Institute, and um, APHA have just published a guide on health and all policies that goes into a lot more detail about some key components of health and all policies, such as um, health equity and sustainability that I just talked about. And I, I hope you'll all take a look at that. But one of the things that we talk about in the guide is the goal of health and all policies, which is really to make sure that decision makers are informed about the health equity and sustainability consequences of policy options during the policy development process. And hopefully, as a result, that the policy outcomes will reflect an understanding of and attention to those consequences. Well, we're not going to make any progress in getting policymakers to consider the health consequences of their decisions unless we learn how to talk about health in all policies. And talking about health in all policies really requires talking about um, the social determinants of health, equity, and sustainability and climate change. And those are all what we've come to refer to as wicked problems. And they're, they're very, very hard to break down and talk to in language that people that don't speak our language can understand. So that's the topic of today's webinar. And um, Lori and Ingrid that, that I'll introduce you to in a moment have also done a great job of summarizing and, and explicating this in the guide. So you'll have a resource you can turn to after the webinar. So we have three presenters today. Um, Lori Dorfman is the director of the Berkeley Media Studies Group and the Public Health Institute. Um, she works with community groups and public professionals so that they can be strong voices for establishing healthier communities. And Dr. Dorfman oversees all aspects of the Berkeley Media Studies Group work, which include research, media advocacy training, and strategic consultation for advocates, and also education for journalists about these important health issues. And if you go on the BMSG website, you'll find Dr. Dorfman's publications as, long as, as well as other resources. Ingrid Daphner Krasnow works as the Strategic Communications Specialist at BMSG and provides media advocacy training and technical assistance to public health advocates around the country. Since joining BMSG in 2008, she has helped to develop strategic media advocacy plans for BMSG clients on issues ranging from nutrition and physical activity to intimate partner violence to language access in the healthcare system. Her research interests include framing of women's health issues in the media and improving health communications to support non-native English speakers. And Julia Kaplan is the program director for the Health and All Policies Task Force in the Public Health Institute, working closely um, in, the, in the California Department of Public Health. That task force is a collaboration between PHI, the California Department of Public Health, and the California Strategic Growth Council. 
And um, Julia has 20 years of experience in community building, social change, management, and public policy leadership. She has worked to support youth leadership, reproductive rights, economic security for seniors, and protections for consumers of financial products. She was a fellow in the Women's Policy Institute in 2009-2010 and holds master's degrees in public policy and public health from the University of California in Berkeley. So we couldn't have a better group to address this um, very important topic. And I'm going to um, just remind you that um, we are not going to open up the phone lines for questions but we encourage you to submit questions via the Q&A feature that you'll find on your um, web screen. And if you send your questions to all panelists, um, that will help other people see the kinds of questions that are being asked. Um, so why don't you send questions all through the conversation, and then we'll come to them at the end of the speaker's presentation. And on that note, I'm going to turn it over to Lori, um, and um, I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Lori? Thanks so much. Uh, um, Linda, this is really great to be here. It's great to not see all of you out there in the audience, but know that you're there because we're excited about this topic as well. And Ingrid's going to take us through the beginning here, and we're going to plow through some ideas for how to express the idea around health and all policies in a way that people outside public health can understand. So Ingrid, I'm tossing it to you. Thanks so much, Lori. Um, and thanks to Dr. Rudolph for that really warm introduction. And we just want to um, acknowledge all the hard work um, that's gone into this toolkit over, I'm sure, much longer than we've been involved over the last year or so. Um, it's really been a pleasure to work with Dr. Rudolph and with Julia and with, with Karen Vimosha as well um, to work on this toolkit. It was so exciting to see it come out yesterday. Um, it's, it's been a long time in coming. And we're excited to share some of the lessons around messaging with you all today. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, hearing some of your ideas, hearing about some of the challenges that folks on the phone are having, um, as well as uh, sharing some hopeful and possible solutions. Um, just a tiny bit about BMSG, it sounds like um, Dr. Rudolph already gave a bit of background on what we do, uh, but in addition to the media advocacy and training that we do, like webinars like this one, uh, we also do research on public health issues, on how the media is covering those public health issues, where we'll take a cross-section of news on a particular issue, be it nutrition or physical activity or tobacco or um, violence against women and look at how that issue is being covered in the news as well as um, what advocates can learn about that coverage and how they can um, use those lessons learned to advance their, their policy change goals. Uh, in addition, we also do the professional education with journalists that was, that was referred to in, um, in Lori's bio. So we do a lot of different things um, and we're excited to be a part of, of this particular team working on how to look at health as, a, as an aspect of every, every policy consideration. Uh, I want to tell you just a little bit more about what we're going to do today, but in the meantime, what I'd like to invite folks to do is participate in another poll. This is where we would like to learn more about what you all are finding challenging in your efforts uh, to talk about health in all policies. So if you could please answer the question, what has been challenging for you in talking about health and all policy, in talking about the health and all policies approach or any other intersectoral collaborative approach? So you can select any of the following that apply to your experiences. Uh, talking with people for whom health equity, in, in quotes, doesn't resonate. Uh, finding information out there in the world about health and all policies. Ensuring that people understand that a health and all policies approach is not lobbying. Tailoring messages for different audiences. Finding an appropriate opportunity to talk about health and all policies. Responding to partners in other sectors who don't see health as their mission or primary mission. Or any other challenge that you may be having. And I believe if you check that box, um, we also would like you to type your answer into the Q&A section uh, down below. So we'll give folks um, a little bit of time to answer those questions. In the meantime, just wanted to tell you a little bit about what we're going to be doing today. Dr. Rudolph already covered um, our goals, but just to give you a sense, 
uh, of why communication matters. Uh, we know that the way that we talk about the solutions that we seek can have a meaningful impact on whether or not we're able to bring those solutions to bear. Um, so with that in mind, we want to give you some key components of those effective messages that can be uh, useful when talking to community partners, um, funders, folks in other agencies or sectors that are, that are working on issues that, that you see as related to health. Uh, we also want to talk about how to broaden the frame to include social determinants of health, as Dr. Rudolph was mentioning. And we also are going to give you an opportunity to hear a role play in which we challenge, um, challenge one of our colleagues to answer some hard questions about health and all policies. And so we can learn about what are some of the common pitfalls as well as what are some of the uh, methods for success. So it looks like we have our poll results back. Um, and it looks like we're seeing some trends. Um, let me just broaden these answers so that I can see what the answers were. So it looks like the most um, common challenge folks are having at 37% of respondents, checking this box, that responding to partners in other sectors about why health in all policies matters is one of the most um, common um, challenges that folks are having, folks who are not necessarily seeing health as their primary issue. Following that uh, challenge, Talking with people for whom health equity, in, in quotes, doesn't resonate is a close second. Again, with 32%, so it's about a, a little over a third of, of participants on the phone have that similar challenge. And then, oh, you know what? I missed one in the middle there. Well, a handful of people didn't give any answers. Uh, that's the one that's in the middle. And then the third um, most common answer looks like it's tailoring messages for different audiences which is a great one to have on this particular call because uh, we are going to be talking about how to address your specific messages for different audiences. So that'll be, um, hopefully you'll get some good clues and insights about how to do that well. Uh, and then we have a sort of a range between, let's say, 5 and 20% or so answering all the other questions. But it looks like at least someone has had, had at least one of these challenges uh, in their work to talk about health and all policies. So we understand that there are a lot of challenges around communicating around health and all policies, and hopefully today's webinar will give you some, some insights um, of how to do that. So I'm going to pass uh, the ball, literally and figuratively, uh, along <laughs> to Lori in, in talking about why message is not the first consideration. Thanks, Ingrid. The, um, it will address um, some of these questions um, sort of generically as we talk, and then we'll, we'll get to them specifically in the Q&A at the end. So, um, keep, so listen for that as, uh, as you think about your questions here. The interesting sort of uh, paradox of today's webinar is that even though we're going to spend the whole time talking about message and explaining framing and understanding those two things together, it's important to remember that message is never first that we shouldn't be deriving a message um, and then figuring out a strategy of how we want to change the world. It's, in fact, the strategy that drives the message. So that means we have to know the answers to these three questions before we can even figure out what we want to say. The first question is, what do you want to change in the world? So writ large, what Health and All Policies is about is changing the way we do business as a society and how our government, how we pool our resources and work together through our government, how we address our problems so that we put health at the top of the list because we care about health, that matters to us. And one of the mechanisms for that is how agencies work together, and that's how health in all policies was conceptualized. I might have... Um, I might be overbroad, Linda. You would talk about how it's conceptualized more precisely, but nonetheless, the thing we want to change in the world is how government does business, how we do business with each other, how community influences that, how business is involved, how all our sectors can work together to produce a healthy society. So we have to know specifically what that change is and then how that happens. That's where we get kind of technical. Does that mean that the people who work on parks and rec do something differently than they do now? Does it mean that the transportation department or education or housing or some other sector in our either uh, private or public sectors 
is there something different about the way they are going to do business? What is that? And that's when we'll get into the kind of the nitty gritty. Maybe there are really specific things that are going to change about institutional practices. You're going to find all kinds of detail about that in the handbook that Linda mentioned. You need to know what that is ahead of time. And the other thing you need to know, and we're going to talk about this a lot, is why. Why do you want it to be changed? Now, a lot of us, including myself, came to public health because this was a way to make the world a better place where we could all have better outcomes, no matter what zip code we were born in, that if we put health concerns first, it meant we would all be able to prosper, do better in life in all kinds of ways. And that kind of sentiment about what motivates the work that we do together isn't often expressed partly because we're so busy working on the technical side of making that happen that we, we don't have time or think about expressing it. And this becomes extremely important for people who are outside the field of public health. They didn't come to public health. They have lots of concerns, as we all do too. But what is going to help people connect to health in all policies is the motivation, the values, the why it matters. And we need to be able to express why we want that to why why we think that policy is important because that's how outsiders will connect with the facts and the structures that we're trying to help them understand and that we want to change and we know this from framing research and the frames Framing is a big concept that lots of people are talking about now. When we started this work 20 years ago, I can tell you nobody used that term. And it's become quite popular now. People are starting to understand that people come to ideas and they come to stories and they come to policy suggestions not as a blank slate, but already with ideas in their heads. There's a foundation of understanding about how we approach the world that we don't think about. It's an automatic thing that happens. It's like the structure of a house that holds it up. When you put your key in the door, you don't think about the door frame providing the structure that you can walk through or the foundation holding up the house. It just operates in the background. And that's how frames work in our brains. And Ingrid in a minute is going to show you an example of how this works. The idea is that we are um, we're brought up in a culture that has certain ideas circulating. Some ideas circulate more often than others. And there are very dominant and prominent ideas about how the world works and about what's proper and right and about um, who's responsible for change that are operating in the background in our minds. And those ideas sometimes come into conflict with the public health approach. What that means is we have to queue up other sorts of ideas so that people can see why a broad range of ideas are necessary and why our policies make sense. Now, I know that was really abstract. Frames are abstract. They're about how we think and about how people extract knowledge and meaning from text, whether that's written or verbal or pictures, like all those pictures Linda showed you at the beginning of the webinar. Those were transmitting ideas about climate change, for example, that you extracted based on other ideas you had in your head. She didn't have to explain each one of those individually. Ingrid's going to show you, a, just to give you a little taste of how this works and what the dilemma is in framing. And then we're going to walk you through a formula that um, isn't an absolute formula, but it's a way to start to analyze the way we're talking about health and all policies so we can get better at helping people see the whole picture. Thanks so much, Lori. Uh, so what I'd like to ask folks to do now is using the chat function in your uh, interface. Well, I think if it's you Q and A they're supposed to use. I'm sorry, Q and A. I was I was um, so focused on getting it right, and I still didn't get it right. The Q and A function, please, um, in your interface to answer the question: What does it say behind this orange box? We'll give folks a second to answer that. Um, what do you think just, it says back there? Just type Keeping in, in this mind... Is my, um, this is my favorite part of the webinar, you know, Ingrid, because we get to see all those words come up really fast. Yes, it's like... Brrr, it's all going up. So 
so everyone who I'm seeing running across my screen um, says prevention works. One person put an exclamation point, and I'm going to assume that was a creative license. Um, so most people are saying that they feel it said prevention works, and sorry if that was a spoiler um, for folks, those of you who hadn't answered yet. Uh, but let's see what it says when we take that orange box away. Aha, it does not actually say prevention works. So let's just do that again just for fun. Um, the orange box is there. As many times as I've done this over the years, I still see prevention works. Um, but in fact, we know now that we've taken the orange box away that it doesn't, it doesn't in fact say that. So what happened here? What happened is that your brain automatically filled in the missing information that was covered up by the orange box. So you had 50% of the information, essentially. You had the tops of the letters, 50%, uh, to go on. And based on what you know and your language skills and, and your um, comprehension, you filled in the remaining 50%. Uh, without having all the information available to you. And then when you had that information available, when we took the orange box away, you saw that, in fact, that was not the case. Well, this is what happens all the time when we're looking for solutions to health problems in the community and when we're thinking about how to frame the way we talk about presenting those health solutions. We often make judgments based on only a limited amount of information uh, without taking into consideration the whole picture. Um, and this is why we oftentimes, if you've heard us talk before, um, with this is why we oftentimes talk about health um, and framing for health specifically as a portrait versus a landscape perspective. So if you think about a portrait of, of a person, you know that you only have a limited amount of information, very similar to this orange box exercise, we only had 50% of the information. In a portrait, you also only have a limited amount of information. You have a lot of detail about a face and maybe the you know, upper body, but you don't have the whole picture. Essentially, you don't have the context in which that person in the photo uh, is living. You don't have their surroundings. You don't have their family history. You don't have their job establishment. You don't have where they live or where their kids go to school or how much money they make or any of those issues if there's parks in their neighborhood, if there's healthy places for them to, if there's places for them to buy healthy food, you don't have any of that information. And what, so what happens is that unprompted, most people still hold individuals accountable for their own health outcomes. When you think about it from a portrait perspective, and you think about why we have some health, these health challenges that we're seeing in the world, we don't think about necessarily the surroundings in which someone li is living, the context of their lives. Um, especially when those outcomes can, can be related to what are sometimes considered quote unquote lifestyle choices, such as smoking or eating or physical or you know um, tendency toward physical activity. And while it's true that the decisions that we make as individuals of course affect our health, it's also very true that our surroundings matter a lot and that individual, individual decisions, excuse me, are always made in the context of social and physical environments that can affect nearly every single one of our decisions. So in order to make the case for health and all policies most effectively, it's important to, to provide an alternative to what we would call a default frame. The default frame here being that individuals are solely responsible for their health. Lori talked about frames as mental structures and how we categorize information. And we learned from this exercise that we make certain assumptions based on a limited amount of information. And what comes out of that is what we call the default frame, which is without enough information, without all the information, our minds intuitively go toward holding individuals accountable for their health. It's part of our culture. It's part of the way that our, our the message that we get from media and from our government and from our history, um, but it's not necessarily accurate in terms of the possible solutions to health problems. And so what we need to do is we need to shift that balance from institutional accountability, I'm sorry, from personal responsibility to institutional accountability. So in a landscape frame, if we're going back to that metaphor, we can use a wider angle and we can see the surroundings around that person in the photo. And it's these surroundings, as we know, that often make the biggest difference when it comes to identifying solutions to our most common health problems. So health in all policies is essentially a way to widen that frame from the portrait to the landscape. Um, you all on the phone know better than, than anyone that health and all policies, among the many other titles that it's been given across the world, how to talk about these intersectoral collaborations around health, 
um, that these are just labels for a larger concept rooted in the fact that environment, the environments in which people live, their surroundings where they live, learn, work, and play, um, shape folks' health outcomes. And this is the motivating rationale behind health and all policies, that if environments matter for health, then our society and, and the agencies, essentially government agencies that serve it, should consider health outcomes in the decisions that shape these environments. Uh, and I know that I'm I'm preaching to the choir here with folks on the phone working working through some of these really difficult communications challenges to talk about why this matters so much. So I'm going to hand the ball back to Lori, who's going to lead us in a discussion of um, what are some of the key concepts, key co I should say, key components of strong messages, so that when we're talking about health and all policies, we can be as effective as possible in widening. Uh, widening our frame from portrait to landscape. And um, Ingrid, go back to the scale just one quick second while I um, I just want to add one thing to what you said. I want to remind people that this is not an either or conversation. Personal responsibility is enormously important. We need lots of it. And when people hear certain things about their health, sometimes they take personal actions that make their health better. And that's a good thing. Um, but we know also that individual actions don't go far enough and that people can't act well for their health if they're in an environment that restricts that. And so that's why, as public health folks, we're helping people see that landscape, see that it's not a uh, portrait or landscape, it's that we want the portrait embedded in the landscape. And it's that the scale is out of balance because our default frame in our society goes right to the individual. If we just say health, and we say nothing else, people will go to, to ideas about what people can do for themselves. So that means it's up to us to help cue up what's in that landscape, what's in that environment that it either can foster health or impinge on health, and to bring that scale into balance. Because I know uh, it, it's easy to dichotomize these things and think that it's either or, but it's not either or, it's really both but we're in a situation in our society where it's out of balance. So now let's show them the equation, um, Ingrid. And so here's, here's what we're trying to, to do when we construct a message about health and all policies. We want to be sure it has certain components, as Ingrid said. One is an environmental cue. And this is important because if we don't help people see the landscape around the portrait, they'll go right to the individual, and there's plenty to think about with the individual. So it's up to us to cue up that environment. And it's important um, to cue it up first. So of all the things that we're going to say about message, order doesn't really matter except for the environmental cue. Because if, if we don't have that, then the rest of it won't make sense. Um, so we'll talk about the environmental cue and, and what that looks like. The other thing we want to be sure we have in our message is a solution. What can we do about this thing that we think is a problem? In public health, we have a tendency to spend about 80% of the time talking about the problem and 20% of the time talking about the solution. We need to reverse that ratio if we want journalists to do it, if we want our colleagues to understand, and if we want people outside public health to understand that there's actually something we can do about this. So that's our job, that's imperative on us to include a solution. And then the last part that we want to highlight is the thing that I mentioned early on. It's the answer to the question, so what? Why does this matter? And that's a larger question that goes to why we care about health and what difference we think it makes in the world. It's a question outside the data. The data inform that question. But it's really about why we care about this. And, and when we put these three things together, then we can get a message that supports health in all policies. So what we're going to do next is look at a sample message and then dissect it a little bit. And we'll, we're going to show you a couple of these dissections. And then we're going to um, try a, a verbal version of this. We're going to put Julia on the spot. And then we will have our Q&A and open it up for discussion. So here's a sample message. It can be something like this. Somebody might ask you, well, what, why is um, why is health in all policies important? You might say, well, families are healthier when they have safe, well-maintained sidewalks that make it easier to walk to school and work. We need to fix the uneven and cracked sidewalks or blocks with no sidewalks at all in the Lincoln neighborhood so that parents feel it's safe for their kids to walk to school. To do that, the transportation agency and the public health agency must work together to support each other's goals and create safe routes to schools for all our children. 
Now, we're going to we're going to dissect this a little bit and you can see it's not a generic message about health and all policies. It's a specific message because each time we talk about this, generally speaking, we're talking to someone specific and we can't talk about everything if it, that's way too vague. We're going to always have to land it on some particular thing. And that's up to us to choose, depending on our audience, depending on the policy at hand, depending on the project that's due first. There can be all kinds of reasons to pick a particular aspect of health and all policies to talk about. So each of the messages will be specific in that way. And that goes back to an earlier thing I said, which is that you have to know what you want to change in the world and how you're going to change it in a specific way. So let's dissect this. Let's look at the environmental cue. Well, that came right up front. Families are healthier when they have safe, well-maintained sidewalks that make it easier to walk to school and work. Now, there's lots of things that will make families healthier. So, and, and once again, as public health people, we'd like to say what all those things are all at once, but we can't ever do that. We always have to choose. There's not enough time. It's not going to be appropriate to say everything in every context. In this example, we're using the particulars of neighborhood safety, and that environmental cue forces you to have a picture that embeds a family in a context. In this case, it's the context about the built environment. The next piece of the message is the solution right up front. We need to fix the uneven and cracked sidewalks, that's the little problem statement, or blocks with no sidewalks at all in the Lincoln neighborhood so parents feel like it's safe for their kids to walk to school. You can see this is kind of problem and solution all married up together. Um, we have to fix the uneven and cracked sidewalks. Well, the uneven and cracked sidewalks are the problem. Fixing it's the solution. We're going to get to kind of how in a second as part of the value statement there. And uh, in the solution, we also talk about the Lincoln neighborhood. You know, we just made that up. But you want to be specific. The people you're talking to are in a place. Use that place. Don't be generic. Be as specific as you can in language, what the framers talk about who study this kind of thing. They talk about it being the difference between um, furniture and chair. Never say furniture if you can say chair. Don't say community when you can name the neighborhood or you can name the region or depending on your audience, the specific that brings a picture to mind. And then it gets wrapped up with the value. To do that, to actually fix the uneven and cracked sidewalks, the transportation agency and the public health agency have to work together to support each other's goals and create safe routes to schools for all of our children. So here in the value statement, that's a, a value of collaboration that we're talking about there and working together and safety. And you can have different values that come to the fore. And, you know, people often ask us, you know, well, how do I choose values that resonate with my audience? And you guys know your audience. You know who you're talking to. But you also know yourselves. And if you don't have a mechanism for polling or deep public opinion research about what your audience is going to respond to, start with yourself. Why do you care about this? Why do you think it will make a difference? What's the value that you hold? Just be sure that's included because it's at the values level that people are going to connect. So Ingrid's going to take you through another example or two, and then we can talk about this more broadly. Thanks, Lori. So we're going to look at a couple different examples now uh, with the values called out more explicitly. In the, in the example that Lori gave us, it was a little bit more generic on the value of health and all policies. Um, what we want to do now is walk you through a couple of examples um, that show how you can apply distinct values to a similar, not identical, but similar message um, and have the, have the outcome be a little bit different, have, have um, the meaning behind it feel a little bit different based on what Lori was talking about, which is folks make decisions based on how they feel about something. In public health, we're so good at talking about statistics, excuse me, statistics and numbers um, that oftentimes we get lost in, in the data and we forget to talk to people just as other human beings. And we know from the research that most decisions are made based on emotion. And so we want to ask people to, to take action based on how they feel about something or based on answering the question, what happens if nothing is done? Why does this matter, like Lori was talking about? So we're going to look at an example now. Um, there we go. Um, on using the value of fairness and equity. So again, we're going to always start with our environmental cue. 
In this example, well-maintained parks provide people with safe places to play and be active. So we're showing that where people play makes a difference in how healthy they are. And we want to make sure that those parks are in good repair. We don't want our kids playing on broken down playground equipment and potentially risking injury. Then we're going to insert our value. So this, again, the value is going to be fairness and equity. It's not right that children in some neighborhoods have plenty of nice parks and playgrounds nearby and others have none. So this idea that we want to make sure that kids in all neighborhoods have safe places to play, not just um, in neighborhoods that can afford, can afford those parks. So we've cued the environment to begin with. We've stated our value. And I think you would probably find that everyone feels like, yes, children in all neighborhoods should have safe places to play. You're probably not going to find um, too many people who question that premise. Now, how you solve the problem um, may differ from person to person. And so that's where you want to insert your solution. So the sample solution that we have here is, that's why we're working, we meaning the, probably the public health department in this example, that's why we are working with the Parks and Recreation Agency to make sure there are sufficient funds to build new parks so that all children in our community have the opportunity for safe play and physical activity. So it's showing this collaboration as a means to achieving um, equity and fairness across communities to make sure that everyone has a safe place to play. So this is just one example about, of how to apply those specific values uh, to a message. Let's look at another one, the idea of efficiency and cost savings. And we know that when we talk about health and all policies, this is oftentimes a strong value that resonates across sectors and across um, government agencies. And so we want to show why this matters. So our environmental cue, again, families are healthier when they have safe sidewalks, but the sidewalks in the Elmwood neighborhood are uneven or cracked or not there at all. So showing why, where people live, work, and play um, affects their health. So in this particular example, the solution comes first. In this message, I should say, the solution comes first. Like Lori said, the order doesn't necessarily matter. You always want to prime the environmental cue first. But from there, the order um, matters less, as long as all the parts are there. The solution in this example being, we can't fix this problem working in isolation. We'd like to work with you, partner agency, to incorporate health criteria into this year's transportation priority. So this is um, for w working with a transportation agency, whether it's local or state or national. Um, the solution is we want to make sure um, that there are health considerations when you are creating your strategic plan, transportation agency. And the value, working together, we can fix multiple problems at the same time, saving money and improving health, which is also good for our economy. So from our perspective as public health folks, we think about health perhaps first and foremost, but when we are talking to people who think about um, their budget first and foremost, we want to show that these are, these are actually problems or these are solutions that can address multiple problems, that we can be efficient and save money and affect health at the same time. So you'll see the value in this one is slightly different from the value in the last one. Um, and so as Lori was saying, it's about starting where you are as individuals, but also thinking about where your audience is and knowing what their values might be. And in a little while, uh, we're going to talk about how to talk with different audiences um, to address different health problems, incorporating and infusing different values based on the values of that particular audience. So Lori's going to lead us in a little discussion of why those audiences matter, who are the different players involved in these conversations. Um, and how you can be really specific and strategic when talking with your target audiences. And there, there might be a lot of different folks you're going to talk to. You're going to talk to each other. You're going to talk to people in your own agency. And you're also going to be talking to civic leaders, elected officials, people at the community level, organizations that are working with you, um, your allies, health departments, researchers, uh, businesses, professional associations, associations, medical providers. There might be all sorts of different messengers and targets for your message. And it just requires a little bit of thought ahead of time and thinking about what the interest is from that group or that perspective. And the and finding not just values, but shared values. What are the things that motivate them that also motivate you? That's the place to start. And it's 
it'll be with a little trial and error. It'll be um, as you are building your supporters and coalitions to work on this issue that you figure out who it is in your community or I around the particular aspect of health and all policies that you're working on that you're going to want to bring together to the table. It's not going to be exactly the same in each situation. But the, the components that you're going to think of um, are the three components of a message strategy as you, as you put this together your players, messengers, and targets. You're going to think about essentially the messenger, the audience, and the message. So the messenger is who's going to speak. The audience is who are they speaking to. And the message is what are they saying and how are they going to say it. And the thinking about the messengers is a useful and interesting uh, thing and worth spending some time on because a lot of times we spend our, we put our focus on what are those words that are coming out of our mouths. But if you think about whose mouth are the words coming out of, that can be very um, interesting in and of itself. Because if you have somebody who, in, they would call it in politics, an unusual bedfellow, who would be an advocate for health in all policies, it's going to make people listen in a slightly different way. My favorite example of this doesn't come from health in all policies, but it comes from a, a good related field, which is early care and education, which we know has health implications. We know people um, do much better in life if they have quality early care and education. And there was a uh, a time when a guy named Art Rolnick was head of the Federal Reserve Bank in the state of Minnesota. And he was working, uh, he was examining the issue of early care and education because as the chair of the Federal Reserve in Minnesota, it was his job as a steward of the state's finances and resources to make recommendations to lawmakers about what the best use of their uh, finance of their resources were, of their money, where should they invest? And so his job didn't answer the question about health, but it answered the question about how can we best use our resources to benefit the state of Minnesota. And the question before him was whether um, they should invest in early care and education or whether they should invest, say, in a new stadium for the football team, the Vikings. And he looked at the numbers. That's his job. He did the math. And when he found out what the difference was, that in fact it wasn't a wise use of the state's resources to invest in a stadium, in much as it, people claim you know, it increases jobs and whatnot, after he did the math, what he found, as many researchers um, have found with early care and education, is that it was a seven-to-one return. For every dollar the state invested, they could expect seven back and if they invested in early care and education. So that's what he told the state. That's what he told the lawmakers. And it was a very different message coming from the chair of the Federal Reserve in Minnesota advocating for high-quality early care and education than it was from a preschool teacher who advocated for it all the time. So think about the messengers. Think about who's delivering the message. He did it from a different value set. He, it's his responsibility to be a steward for the state. Stewardship and fiduciary responsibility were some of the values behind what, was, what he was doing. But also, when he talked about it, he said that this investment not only served those purposes, but it was an investment in our democracy. He took that value up to the highest level. This is about the society that we want to create together where every family can thrive. And that's a way to introduce an equity message. That's a way to introduce the kinds of values messages that take us to our highest calling. And it's at that level that we are going to find some of the shared values across the different agencies that we that we work on this issue together with, transportation, housing. It's, it crosses the boundaries. So messenger becomes very important, and as well as you know, the message. And so we're going to move now to um, trying this out. So, um, so Julia, um, I'm going to call on you, and um, I'm going to ask you a question. And Hi there. Hi. It's no secret what that question is. Okay, you can hear me well? I can. I can. Okay. And so and I want you to answer I'm gonna ask you this question as if I'm a member of the local board of supervisors. 
and I'm hearing about this among all these other things that I have to pay attention to. And, you know, I have to pay attention to a lot of different issues. I've got lots of constituents banging on my door. I'm concerned about the county's budget. We have lots of responsibilities for taking care of people in emergencies, and we've got water systems to worry about and all sorts of things. And um, it's, it's not an easy time to be at the Board of Supervisors. And now you're talking to me about this thing, and I say back to you, well, why is, why is health and all policy? Policies important. Great. I'm so glad that you asked. And I know that being on the Board of Supervisors, you're charged with supporting a whole lot of different policy goals with very limited funding. You're worried about economic development and jobs, access to parks, community safety, local agriculture, transportation. And it turns out that all of these policy areas impact our ability to live healthy lives, whether we have safe places for physical activity, whether we have access to healthy foods, whether we have access to jobs. And in addition, as I'm sure you know from your work, no one agency can solve any of these, these issues completely. These are complex issues that are very closely interrelated. So health and all policies is a way to collaborate across agencies so that together we can pursue all of these goals, we can figure out ways to be more efficient, and we can also help people in our communities be healthier and happier along the way. It's already been embraced by our state government, and I think our county could really benefit by trying out this health and all policies approach. Julia, I think that might make sense, but I think if I go over to um, transportation or housing, aren't they just going to tell me that, uh, you know, health should stay in its own little sandbox? Are you trying to make these other agencies do your work? Well, I think that people within those departments probably do recognize that their work really does intersect with each other's work. And I know for a lot of trans our transportation department is prioritizing this Complete Streets initiative which is all about making it easier for people to be able to walk and bike and take public transit. So I think it might be really exciting for them to have information about how they're actually promoting health. And if we can help them build that understanding, it may actually help them achieve their goals too. I, I know you, th you have told me in the past that you think this is going to make government more efficient. But it also sounds to me like it's one more meeting to attend. How can you guarantee for me that this is really going to make the difference that you say? I think the, a really important thing about health and all policies is that this is not about creating new projects for the sake of new projects. This is about looking at the goals that we already have as a county, looking at the goals that each of our departments already have, and figuring out how, by working together, we can achieve those goals better, faster, in more depth. So it's really about enhancing the things that we're already working on. Well, Julia, you almost have me convinced. I think the next time we meet, maybe you could bring a colleague from another department, and then we can think together about how to talk to the other members of the Board of Supervisors. I would love to. Well done, Julia. <laughs> Thank you. So, um, Ingrid, did you have any thoughts about that uh, little exchange? Yes, so um, I thought you did a great job, Julie, and obviously you've thought a lot about this. Um, so you were one of a perfect person to ask uh, to do this role play with us, so thank you. Um, there were a couple things. I, I think you did a lot of things really well in terms of naming what the benefits would be um, to your audience. Um, one of the things that stood out to me, though, that was perhaps um, you might not want to do next for the next time is – you used what we would call an elephant trigger, and I feel like I heard it. I heard it at least a couple of times. And we call an we, elephant trigger um, is a term we borrowed from some colleagues um, up at Portland State University, as well as it's been informed by uh, George Lakoff's research. And the idea is when you call out something that you don't want your audience to think about, or you or you are trying to distinguish what you are trying to do from what you are not trying to do automatically what's left in your audience's mind is that thing that you're not trying to do. Um, so it's from George Lakoff's research of don't think of an elephant. When you ask people not to think of an elephant, it's pretty hard to get them to think about anything else. And where I heard you do that, that I would advise to try to avoid in the future, 
was early on um, where you said, I know you're worried about jobs and you're worried about X and you're worried about Y. And while you may have the solutions to some of those challenges, the way that you framed it as something that your audience was worried about, for me, made me more worried. Oh, yeah, you are, right? I'm worried about all those things, and I don't think that I'm going to find a solution in talking to you. So that was one place. Another place was just right here at the end where you said, this is not about creating new projects just for the sake of new projects. Um, where in my mind, I hadn't really been thinking about that. And then I said, oh, well, yeah, maybe this is just an extra thing that I don't really need to be doing. Um, so I would encourage you just to focus on the positive of what you are trying to do rather than what you're not trying to do. Great. So, um, so we could um, do this again. But I, Linda, I want to ask you, I, I know that people have been um, submitting questions. Do we want to just go um, next to our, our Q&A? Um, or do, would we? Would you like us to do one more role play here with Julia? Um, I think we have time for you to do one quick role play, okay. and then I think you can just sort of um, finish up with your final comments, and then we'll move into the Q and A. And very good. Poll. Okay. Thanks. So, Sorry. so Julia, I'm going to ask you now this question. Now I want you to imagine. Um, that I'm a school district superintendent. And you've come to me again because you want to engage me in this um, health and all policies idea. And so we've had a little conversation. Maybe we're standing at a reception somewhere. It's kind of casual. And, and you're starting to tell me about this because you want to enlist me in some way or another. And my response to you, um, you know, with my beverage in my hand is, that Julia, I, I've actually I've heard of this this idea, and it, it sort of makes sense. But you know, I have to tell you that these days the schools are strapped, and everybody is kind of looking to the schools to do and be everything. And really, given the circumstances that the families are in, that the kids are in, it is all we can do to be sure these kids are getting the education that they need. So I'm. Even though I can understand that this might be important, I'm a little bit reluctant to embrace it because I just don't think I could pile another thing on my principals and teachers. Right. Well, I completely understand that, and I want you to know that I, coming from a health perspective, and I work at the health department, I'm really committed to your goals. I'm really committed to educational attainment, to higher graduation rates, because I know that these are factors that have a huge contribution to health outcomes, not just for young people, but for people throughout their entire lives. So I'm working with my colleagues to figure out how we can better support educational attainment and support your goals, and we also know that kids are up against a lot when they go to school. They're facing challenges around violence, around nutrition, around housing, around transportation, and all of these factors impact education uh, and in turn impact health. So what I'm doing through Health and All Policies is exploring ways that we can work together, schools, public health, parks, police, transit planners, to think about how to support these broad goals and figure out if there's some things that we can do through a partnership that are going to actually make these things easier for you to achieve. So I'm hoping that we can have, you know, do some follow-up and think about how we might be able to partner. Well, I, I'm always looking for things that make uh, my life and the lives of my principals and teachers easier. Um, and so do you have some specific thing that you want us to do, or what would be the, um, can you give me an example? What's the, what's the next step? Uh, I'd like to set up a meeting with, I'm actually talking with our local planner, planning department. They're working on their general plan, and they're thinking about how to better promote health through the general plan, and one of the things is around public transportation, and I think there's some opportunities to work with the school district to make sure that as we're doing planning around transportation and parks and other kind of built environment features, that we're doing that in a way that supports the schools and is aligned with the school plans. 
Well, that sounds good, Julia. So I'll look forward to hearing from you. And um, I might still need a little more convincing, but I'm willing to have that next conversation. Thank you. So how's she do, Ingrid? Um, I, I thought you did a great job, Julia. And I think um, my uh, feedback was going to be, I think, where Lori's um, role play led you, which is to a more specific ask. Uh, and maybe you, in this in this role player in general, wouldn't have a specific solution in mind, but the next step might be a meeting. Um, and so I would encourage you to, when you're talking about this, um, know what you want to come out of your conversation. So it's not just, let's think about how we can collaborate, because then people nod and smile and say, oh, yeah, great idea, and then you don't talk to them for six months. But it could be, let's think about how we can collaborate. Are you free in the next two weeks for an hour meeting? Um, and so that you can really pin them down on something um, concrete. Or if you have a solution in mind, mentioning that solution so that they walk away with something specific. I think that's, that's good advice. And it might even be more specific than a meeting, Julia. It might be that you have a, an idea about what the education uh, role is in this instance, or as is the case in health and all policies in general, is that you want to solicit from them what that is and inviting people to you know critique an idea you have to make sure that you're you're not the expert in education they are you know give them um, give them the role of expert to play in that situation too and that might also be a, a useful way to invite them into that conversation um, Julia did you have any thoughts you know this is a role play in front of all these in, is, invisible people and I'd I'm, like to know gonna, how you felt about it I'm going to oh, go ask that you sort of wrap up the role play and move on because I do want to leave time for questions okay that's fine thanks so, I so think that's you, fine thank you Lori and Ingrid yeah. great you're welcome so, so you want to take the final uh, slides there Ingrid sure so just a few reminders here um, from what we've talked about today. We always want to trigger the environmental frame first. Remember where people, um, the context in which people live, you have to prime the environment. Talking about values um, very early on, well, incorporating values. I, like we said, the, the order doesn't matter so much as environment. Um, and making sure that the solution is clearly and gets as much attention um, or more as the problem. And then just a few tips for you to take home. So this is the kind of thing you could jot down on a little index card and have by the side of your computer when you get a call from a reporter or from a colleague who has questions, um, knowing what you're trying to achieve, knowing your goals. Staying focused on this message. So it's really easy to get off track because we're always trying to achieve so many different things. Decide what your message is from the beginning and stay focused on that specific message. We've talked about values a number of times. Again, resisting the urge to say everything. It's easy to get into the expert mode and want to talk about everything you know, uh, which means that people are going to leave with um, sort of more of a cloudy vision of what you're looking at rather than a specific vision. Um, sticking to your expertise, so never want to make up anything you don't know. Um, preparing in advance for hard questions, so knowing that uh, what folks might ask you in advance so that you can be prepared and providing compelling examples that are localized to your neighborhood or to the neighborhood in which um, your audience is living or, or taking care of. And also, finally, just using plain language. It's easy to get wrapped up in the jargon, and we internally in the public health world have so much jargon that it's second nature to us. But as Dr. Rudolph mentioned early on, how do we have these conversations with folks who don't necessarily speak our language? And the way is just to use really simple, plain language. Um, so those are just a few tips. and and our, um, and our appreciation for your spending part of your day with us. Um, now we're happy to take questions, and I think, uh, Dr. Rudolph, you were going to facilitate the Q&A, is that right? Hi, hi, hi. Yes, Thanks, thank uh, you so much, Lori, Ingrid, and Julia. And we're going to um, take questions now. And so let me just get us to the... Um, uh. So, Linda, you were going to read us a question, is that right? Yeah. Well, so I want to I want to just remind people about using the Q and A feature. And while 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 people are turning in questions, 
Um, and while we get started on that, I just also want to put up one last poll. Um, and that the poll question is, what would you find most useful for supporting or creating health and all policies efforts in your jurisdiction? Um, and you can see a list here, training, hearing about what other states are, and localities are doing, speaking with other states, creating a community of practice on health and all policies, more information on specific policy areas, guidance on funding sources, tools and strategies, or other. So while you're answering that, we'll give you a few minutes to answer that poll, but I'll tee up with um, a, the first question to Ingrid and Lori, which is um, what if, how do we incorporate these different components when we're in a situation where the length of the messages or the time that we're able to speak to somebody is really, really constrained. And um, do we incorporate everything in every message, or do we just focus on one of the three components? Well, that the answer to that question is it depends. And that's the answer to a lot of questions, because what it depends on is what you're trying to achieve at the moment and who that audience is. And so you have to factor that into how you construct your message. But generally speaking, all the messages we gave you today as examples were essentially three sentences long. This is, these aren't dissertations. Messages are, are answers to a question. And you do need to help people see the environment. Otherwise, they're going to just go back to what individuals can do and why shouldn't that be where all the responsibility lies. So what you want to do is help people see that the environment matters here. So you need some indication of that. But all of these, I think, were pretty short messages. It's just that you can't say everything about health and all policies anytime you're asked anything about it. You have to choose. So since you have to choose, you have to base that choice on some kind of criteria you have for what it is you're trying to achieve or who that audience is or who your messenger is. So from, the, from a generic abstract place, I can't tell you what that choice will be. But once you've made that choice, just as we used the built environment in the first example we gave you, that was a choice. We could have talked about food. We could have talked about climate change. We could have talked about asthma. We could have talked about any number of health outcomes that would improve if health and all policies were adapted, adopted. Sorry. So if you choose that, that's your first step in narrowing. And then just be sure whatever the context is, the environmental context around that is included up front and that you say why it matters. Great. So um, a couple of people have asked questions about um, how, how, does, how do you think about the framing if you're working with people from other cultures or who speak other language, and I think that's really more generically some questions about how do you know what the value frame of your audience is so that you can tailor your message accordingly? Well, you ask them. Um, but as I said earlier when we were talking about it, you might ask them formally in public opinion research. You just might talk to them. It's the same way you go out and find out any kind of formative research and needs assessment on any public health issue. You go ask your audience. So that's not really different. It's that you don't have the opportunity to do that enough, and you certainly don't have the opportunity to do that every time you're crafting a new message. And that's why I say it's at least, at minimum, know why it matters to you. Know why it matters to your agency. How does it relate to the mission of what we're doing collectively in public health? How does it relate to the mission of the agency you're trying to attract? There's plenty of values there that are shared that just need to be invoked. The whole message doesn't have to be about the values. You just have to give people a way in, a way to connect at a human level about why this is important. Okay. Thank you. So um, there's also a couple of questions that I think I'm going to um, ask um, both both um, Lori and Julia to take a crack at, and that is um, in in some localities um, people are more resistant than in others to the to concept of health and all policies, um, and they sort of 
react negatively to the term and the concept because it feels to them like, you know, why are you doing this and health should just stay in their own track and this is, quote, health imperialism. How do you start the conversation in that kind of a setting? Julia, why don't you take the first crack at that because I know that's been, you've had to deal with that. Sure. I And this is something that I'm continually asking other people for their thoughts about. So I think this is, we're kind of figuring this out as we go along. I think that the most important thing about health in all policies is the values that we embrace. And the actual term health in all policies is not the, the important part of this work. So I have no problem with people calling this other things in other communities and figuring out language that reflects the values of that community. I think that in some places we're going to talk a lot more about efficiency and reducing redundancies. Um, you know, I think that we're going to figure out messages that are different for different places. But I think ultimately, um, you know, this, and I think that a lot of this is about shifting that frame that you talked about earlier, the individual frame to the environmental frame, and that's going to be more of a challenge in places that embrace the individual frame more deeply. Yeah, I think it's a challenge across the board in public health. It's what we're always up against on every issue. And it takes time and persistence and also examples. And so I think Julie is right. You can you don't have to stick to labels. In fact, health and all policy becomes jargon and especially if you say HEAP or whatever the acronym is, I'd say don't use any language that people outside the agency wouldn't understand, if you, even if it means you have to use a few more words, because you want to be plain and you want to speak about the outcomes, what you're expecting to happen, why this is a good use of public resources and public thinking together, and take people back to that high level of why, the, why working together across our agencies is going to be better for serving the specific missions that we have. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, I think it's helpful, and hopefully it's <laughs> helpful to those who ask the question. So I think we have time for just one more question with a quick 30-second answer, which is um, CDC has been pushing the use of storytelling, which can focus more on an individual um, than on their environment. So do you have any tips for how to use stories skillfully in the context of, of what you've presented about the importance of incorporating environmental cues and values and solutions? Um, you know, I think that's a great question, um, Linda, because we are hearing that a lot about storytelling. And it comes from a good place that people, you, we want people to connect and we want them to connect at an emotional level. And I think stories can be u very useful in that. And that's, you know, when you talk to reporters, that's what they say their job is, is to tell stories, tell important stories, good stories, meaningful stories. The danger is exactly as you described, that stories, generally speaking, have heroes. And because we have a culture that focuses so intensively on rugged individualism, the hero story is one that we recognize, we're fond of telling, and it's easy to repeat. And even in a public health context, we tell stories of heroes overcoming great odds. But every time we do that, we reinforce the idea that the environment doesn't matter, that if people try hard enough, they can be healthy on their own. And we know that's just not the case for enough people. So we have to tell a story that pulls the lens back and, again, embeds that protagonist in the story in the scene. And in, in a way, um, what some people have called it, it's like um, uh, focusing on the actors and, instead of the stage. And we have to put the whole thing in focus. 
So if we're going to tell a story, we have to be sure that that story traverses the landscape and makes the landscape visible for people. And you can do that. I mean, we think about the area of violence and violence prevention, which has, uh, uh, is a public health issue that touches all sorts of things, education, housing, transportation, and emergency rooms and hospitals. And if we just focus on, if we're talking about violence among youth and we just focus on the kids who are shooting each other or beating up on each other and not talking about who makes alcohol available or what the education system is doing or isn't doing to make those children welcome in the classroom or whether the disciplinary programs are using trauma-informed care and other things that we know make a difference, um, we're going to focus back on blaming the individual. So the story we tell has to be inclusive of the environment. If we just focus on the individual, we are doing more harm than good. Okay, that's a great place for us to close. I want to really thank our presenters for um, an excellent presentation. And I want to thank, whoa, somebody's moving my slides. I want to thank Star Tiffany and Joanna Hathaway and Karen Ben Moshe, who have been helping with the logistics on um, the webinar. And um, I want to remind all of you about this resource. Many of the questions that we got were actually about um, large, uh, other concepts that are really important in health and all policies. Um, and not so much on the messaging specifically. So I want to encourage you to look at this new um, resource, uh, the Health and All Policies, a guide for state and local governments. And I want to thank all of you for participating very much in the webinar, and I hope you'll tune in um, for future Dialogue for Health webinars and remind you that the recording and slides will be available at the Dialogue for Health website. So with that, thank you all very much, and um, we hope you all are successful as you proceed with your um, health and all policies work. Thank you. <laughs>